Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. We are at Historic Vicksburg and we are going to be going through the National Battlefield and checking out some fun facts, some brain wrinkles, and a little bit of history. So come along with me and help me explore through time as we find out what Vicksburg has to offer. Before moving inside the visitor center, we find two large stone statues. These are memorials for the Union and also the Confederate troops and they line a group of cannons. Now, why come to a battlefield? Why come to Vicksburg Military Park? Because we each gain a few brain wrinkles about the past so we can make a better tomorrow by learning about the things that happened in each one of the military engagements of the Civil War. I think it's very important that we value these places because they are a historic reference of something that's happened in our country. And so by coming to these, we get to learn a little bit more about what happened, why it happened, how it happened, and the people who were involved. And so as we move into the visitor center, we'll set the context, but there's also a historic tour road that we can go along to see portions portions of where the engagements happened and there will be some signs and plaques that we can read along the way to kind of set things in our minds visually so that we can understand how sprawling this battlefield actually was. Now I've been to many battlefields here on the channel previous and in doing so each one of them connects to the next because ultimately they were parts of different engagements. So as we're moving through they may reference a few of those and if they do we'll be able to put that together for the next stop that we make as well. Okay after catching up on a little bit of the content context of why we are here, now it is time for us to officially start on the auto tour. Now throughout the auto tour you're going to see a series of monuments and then also plaques. These plaques will signify the engagement pieces and what was going on in the area. The monuments will actually tell you who was there doing those things. Starting off today's trip we decided to pick up a map which helps us to learn about the different stops. All of the stops are indicated on the map with numbers that correspond to a description which gives you a bit more historical context. Now a couple of these roads are closed currently because they had a lot of rain and it washed out the roadways and so whenever I was inside speaking to the ranger he did mention that you can still go to some of these places but you have to hoof it in and so if you choose to do so you can however right now I think we're going to stick to what's on the map and what's available and I think this is going to be wonderful. Something unique to note right as we drive in is as you're coming around the corners, you never know what you'll find. Pull-offs like these are abundant and tell you different pieces of the history. For example, you can see this sign right here and you can't really tell what it says if you're just passing by. So pull off, take the time and stop to read the different signs so you can learn a little bit more about each of the sections. Additionally, pull-offs like this allow you to see who the main players in this were. For example, this is WMJ Landrum and he was the colonel of the 19th Kentucky Infantry and was the commanding 2nd Brigade and 10th Division 13 Corps between March 29th and July 4th of 1863. Now there are hundreds of these, hundreds upon hundreds. So take your time, don't push yourself if you're coming to a place like this and really soak in the significance. Also, when you're around, look at the surroundings around you. Now, in this direction, we may see apartments and things like that just beyond this ravine. But on the other side, you have an untouched look at what it would have been like at the time that they were actually doing these battles. A lot of times in our minds, we think, oh, it's just a big clear field and they're just kind of shooting at one another from, uh, you know, that distance. But in all reality, they would have to traipse through some of the nastiest, most rugged terrain because a lot of these places were just wild land at the time. And so you can see that and soak it in a little bit more by taking that moment to see these things and again visualize and put into play the context of where you're standing what you're looking at and what it is telling you as far as the eye can see we find these different monuments and each one of them is very significant 
and each one of them is slightly different from the next. Did you know that a lot of people come to battlefields to recreate? They come to run, to ride their bicycles, to walk their dogs, and these are great places for you to get out in the nature around you in a more controlled environment, but also in a place that you can have just a moment to kind of take it in. And I think that that's something that's really significant to all the battlefields that I've visited thus far. But other things that you might not think about is that they do also provide an educational experience while you're doing those things. So while you're taking your deep breath or you're just having your casual walk, take a moment to read some of these signs. For example, the Wisconsin 18th Infantry was led by Colonel Gabriel Bach and Lieutenant Colonel Samuel W. Beal and also Major Charles H. Jackson. But as you can see, there's a lot more to explore, so let's go find out what this very large spire is. So here we learned that there are over 1,300 monuments and markers that have been placed around the property to memorialize the soldiers who fell. But more importantly, this park is here to teach future generations of Americans to never take up arms against one another. And I think that that's something we could all take and learn from. These places are a place of reverence. Many people fought and passed away in these areas. Out of respect, we come to see where they are at their final resting place. However, the story behind places like this is the more important and more valuable one. Without places like this, we might forget. We might forget that things happened, that America was split, it was divided, that we didn't agree upon things. And even in today's world where we don't agree upon many things and violence is happening more and more frequently, sometimes we forget places like this exist. I encourage every person, no matter what they think politically, to come to a place like this and just soak it in, to understand what happened in these spaces and to not pretend that history does not exist. Instead, to see history and the value that it has to contextually put us all in a place of better understanding. I think that we can all learn from places like these for a variety of reasons, but there's a lot more learning to be had and we're very early into this tour. So let's continue. Now, clearly in a park like this, there's just gonna be way too much information to cover all of it because the engagement took days upon days upon days. So historically, being able to see some of the context of the different stops as we're kind of going through them is the more important value. So I implore you to come out here and see all of the pieces and put the details together for yourself. Again, I've been to many battlefields in my history of my channel, and I do have a battlefields playlist if you're interested in seeing a few more of those so that you can put history together as well. But now we're at another stop, so we're gonna pull off to safely not block the roadway and see what's here. High atop this barrier right here, this little hilltop, we have a Union marker as well as this. Here we see that two sections of the battery served two six pounder guns and two James rifles in this position from about May 31st until the end of the siege, July 4th, 1863. But more importantly, in this section, we're actually able to visualize what that might've looked like. The cannons are facing the direction of the engagement itself. This would have been a manned cannon, which would have had to have numerous people operating this one piece of heavy heavy artillery. And in this direction, you can see there's a slight ravine just below it. Some of these trees may not have been here, but others might have been. And to see it and visualize that potentially firing was going in this direction and knowing that there were casualties that were reported as well as those who were wounded by the end of the siege, it really does show you the human impact of how much work it would have taken just to be here. Now, I am here on a decent day with a little bit of an overcast sky. It's kind of chilly. I have the ability to go inside and not worry about the rain. Some of these guys were out here in the trenches, quite literally, in the pouring rain, in the freezing conditions, in the very humid heat of the summer as the end of the engagement drew near. And in doing so, they were gutting it out and trying to just hold their positioning at the command of their commander in hopes of their side winning the war. But we continue going forward and there's even more here to share. And that is this the U.S. Missouri 10th Infantry, assault May 22nd, 1863, 
For noon position, wounded three. Again, each of these is significant to the people who fought in this area. Each one has something that signifies who they were, what their impact was, and also something that resonated with their individual state of engagement. I have always wondered when coming to battlefields specifically, who was able to track the positioning. They had maps, they had things like that, but when you come back out and put together a park, who gets to determine what goes where? Well, when you go into the visitor center, you get to learn a little bit more about that, which is why the visitor center is such a valuable resource to you as you get going. We are now positioned in the location of the highest amount of concentrated Union firepower. At one point in time, they had 22 of these big boy guns right in this area. And that was what allowed them to ultimately weaken the Confederate Army. Now, this area is beautiful. Looking on it today, it is rolling, grassy fields. You can see just so far into the distance, and it is absolutely expansive, but also impressively gorgeous. But one of the things that I learned here at this stop is they have some QRs that are on some of the signs and if you hover over it with your phone it'll pull up a video telling you a bit more about the area from a park ranger and that's super handy. So I think that that is something that makes battlefields and places like these a bit more accessible to us all. Playing into the natural landscape is only part of this however. There are also these large mounds that are built to protect those in the trenches, so to speak. This would allow the cannons to sit down a bit lower, but only to be able to graze over the top of the hillsides. I will say this area is very windy today and it's exposed to the elements the most of any other place that we've seen thus far. And in that it is cold and it is hard to just exist. So again, think of the soldiers having to exist in this without cover. They're just out there. The sounds just echoing everywhere. The cold chill of the cooler months and the blazing sun of the warmer months. It just really kind of gives you an idea as to what it would have been like to be in one of these engagements. These engagements were not short. Although there were some that lasted a few days here and there, some of them lasted months upon months and people were out, not with the modern day things that we have now for our military, but instead with very primitive means in comparison when it comes to their uniforms and their safety and things like that. So our modern military definitely has benefited from the stories of our previous military. However, to look back on those people, they were just average everyday people, some of them, just out here fighting. Here we learn that we are on the historic Jackson Road, which was a critical link between Jackson and Vicksburg during the Civil War. To guard this key entrance, the Confederate forces built a major fort here, and the 3rd Louisiana Redan was actually stationed in this area. In fact, it tells us if we look to our left on the end of the road, we can see where the higher ground beyond the fort wall started to begin. Now, at this stop, there once was a huge, huge fortress of a building. It's no longer here, but instead we have a few other structures that we can see. Now, this was a major stronghold for the Confederates, so of course the Union needed to take this down, which is what started so many of the conflicts in this particular part of the roadway. So now we're going to go and find out a little bit more of the story as we move toward the mammoth structure that we saw all the way over from the opposite side 
of this part of the battlefield. This is actually the Illinois State Memorial. It was dedicated in 1906, and at the time it cost $190,000. Translating that to today's standards, that is over four million, almost five million dollars. And you can see it high atop the hillside, where everyone who comes here can see it. It is a blazing reminder of what has happened here, but why? The reason why is because it was a huge piece of the Civil War. Vicksburg stood a massive, massive piece of that overall message. And so by having this memorial here, they actually brought in a lot of people from both the Union and Confederacy to unveil this whenever it first became a thing. See, a lot of times we talk about the significance of each individual battle and we think of things like, for example, Gettysburg, but we don't think of places like Vicksburg just off the top of our tongue necessarily. However, it has just as big of a significant value when it comes to the overall scheme based on what happened here. The only thing more exciting than getting to see something like this in person is being able to see and feel it and know that so much work went into each piece of this to memorialize such a historic event. The architecture that is exhibited here is something very similar to what you see in Washington, D.C. It's beautiful, it's brilliant, it's mammoth. And the more that you look, the more that you see. As you come inside each of these little areas, you look up and you see small details that you couldn't see from the bottom. And as we move into now when you're visiting, there are several different stops that you can make. Some of them are handicap accessible, others are not. So kind of keep that in mind whenever you're visiting. However, as a whole, everything can be seen online. They do have some resources available for you to check out these things, even if you can't make it up the difficult stairs, for example. We are now stopping off at the Shirley House, which is this little home right here, and we have some really great information. We were just talking about the oppressive heat during summer months, but actually the Shirley House, it became a union point of interest. They were able to make these little dugout structures to keep themselves a bit cooler during those super warm months. These were known as shebangs. Now, unfortunately, the Shirley home was pretty badly damaged during the war. And as a result, it had to be abandoned. It served as a Union Army smallpox quarantine hospital at one point in time, and then in 1900 was bought by the U.S. government. Now the building that we're seeing has been restored, and it's actually one of the only remaining wartime buildings actually inside the military park itself. Now imagine this. You live in a home, and it becomes a point of engagement. What do you do? Believe it or not, this was pretty typical during that time. People would have their homes overrun by either Union or Confederate soldiers, and they would come in and take their crops, use their water, and sometimes even take over control of their homes so they can make it into a command center. Now, I have a question for you guys. If you were just existing in your space and all of a sudden the troops rolled up and said, hey, we need this, what would you do? you would give it to them. You would be afraid that if you didn't give it to them, they would take it from you. And that's what happened with many people during the Civil War. A lot of people lost their homes as a result of people coming up and needing these spaces for various activities. I even saw in one place, the Battle of Bull Run in fact, that one woman didn't see the North and the South. She didn't see the Confederate and the Union. She just saw people. And when people would come into her space and say, can we have water? She would aid them by giving them water, no matter who they were, because ultimately it was not her fight. And in doing so, whenever it came time to repair her home, because it was badly damaged and to repair her lands, she was given nothing, nothing at all. Why? Because she gave aid and comfort to the enemy. She was considered to be an insurrectionist, believe it or not. And that potentially is the sadder toll of the war. The war in general, it affected a lot of regular everyday normal people just minding their business. And that didn't necessarily have a dog in the fight. They didn't want to be a part of any of the things that were going on. And they instead decided that they wanted to sit back. 
but the war came to them anyway. And these were regular families, families that had been ranching on lands or who had farms or had just a small postage stamp because they were an immigrant. And ultimately they lost everything if they didn't participate. The war is a very dirty, ugly thing. And that's why we come to places like this so we can learn about that. So we can see that if this were to happen again in our country, guess what? It would be dirty. No one is a winner when there is war. In fact, despite what people would like to believe, there is no good guy, bad guy, white hat, black hat, winners, losers. It's, it's not one of those things. War's complicated, where it's ugly, it's dirty, it's grimy. And as we continue along this course, we'll actually see the physical toll of regular people. They were brothers, they were uncles, they were dads. They were serving on both sides. And now they're all in their final resting place. That's why places like this Illinois that we just went to are significant because when this was actually erected and opened, people from both sides of the coin came together and they remembered their fallen brethren because ultimately, they were the ones to pay the price. Now, before we move on to our next stop, I wanted to address something that I have addressed many times before when I've gone to battlefields, and that is that people want to talk about the reasons behind the Civil War. Now, I have addressed that on my previous videos before, but one of the things that I have learned is that no matter how many facts are presented, some people will still be angry in the comments, no matter what's happening. The fact of the matter is, war is complicated like I discussed before. It's not just a issue of one thing. There were many things that went into the Civil War, but there was one main thing that contributed to a lot of the anger and tension behind it. I like to talk about facts and live in reality. So we're not gonna discuss that further because I know that that's a sensitive topic for a lot of people. But all reality is that division between us and hatred toward others gets us absolutely nowhere. Historically, throughout the entire history of the world, guess what? Conflict as a result of wanting to be better than or wanting to presume that you have more or that someone should have less has never been beneficial to the bigger picture of the greater good. So I'm just gonna leave that on the table. You can do with that what you will. If you're not interested in that particular answer, this might not be the video for you and I'm okay with that. Because again, I live in reality, facts, and what is presented and when something is presented to me, I like to believe it because, you know, one site leads you to the next site, leads you to the next site, and all of it seems to factor around a few common things. Believe it or not, we are only at stop number four on the map. This place is expansive. It covers so much distance. And as you're kind of moving around, again, you see the signs kind of interchanging from red to blue. In fact, I see a blue sign right ahead, but I also see another Wisconsin monument right here. But the thing that caught my eye the most was this much larger monument, which is right around the corner. Again, with over 1,300 markers, there's no way we can even begin to scratch the surface. You could spend days going through and reading each and every one of the positions. They do tours here, and they also have some other very interesting things that they offer at various points in the year. I encourage you, if you are a history lover, to come out and take one of those tours and get a bit more of a detailed view. We have made it to stop nine, which is Fort Hill, and this is the most impressive view in the entirety of the military park. Here you can see the waterways, the very waterways that they were trying to both defend as the Union and also control as the Confederacy. And here you get a aerial positioning. Interestingly enough, this is also where one of the larger forts was that did some of the most damage in this region. In fact, Right up the road here, we get to the Cairo, which is an ironclad ship that would come down these very shipping channels and bring about lots of firepower. But the Cairo wasn't alone in this. There were lots of other boats that would go up and down and they would deliver supplies. Well, guess who wanted all of those? The Confederacy. Guess who didn't want them to have them? 
the Union. And so it became a point of interest for both sides. And in doing so, it created some of the most horrific gunfire from the cannons, sinking an entire ship which was later recovered and raised a hundred years later. We begin with this sign, which actually tells the story of the engagement between March 29th and July 4th. It talks about the river batteries that were under command of Colonel Edward Higgins and the artillery that he commanded. It also shows that there were six different companies of Tennessee heavy artillery on the right, four companies of the 8th Louisiana in the center, and eight companies of the 1st Louisiana heavy artillery on the left. So as you can imagine, with that heavy artillery positioned at the top of this giant hill overlooking all the waterway, the Confederates definitely had the advantage when it came to this particular location. However, there's more to this story to be had, so we're walking upstairs to find out. Up top, you will find more signs to explain the positioning of the Confederates and also another dug-in trench to protect the cannons and the heavy artillery. Here you can find a variety of different pieces of this story, and they continue over into that area over there, away from the waterfront itself, which happens to be right over here. We're gonna end our tour here at stop eight because ultimately this is the bigger picture of war, the cemetery. Because like this says, the muffled drums, sad roll has beat, the soldier's last tattoo, no more on life's parade shall we meet, that brave and fallen few. There was an act created on February 22nd, 1867, section three, that established to protect national cemeteries because they held all of the memories of those who once were. They protect the honor of those who had served proudly and they allow people to come and pay respects to those who have fallen. We discussed as we went around the entirety of the military park, the human toll is the one that always unfortunately happens as a result of war. And in doing so, Many of those who fought so bravely ended up in places like this. Their final resting place was not going home to their families. It was not being able to protect and preserve their property, but instead they now lay in national cemeteries like these. I'm going to give you all a few moments as I conclude this video to see the real toll of war. Because all too often we talk about the war itself and not the people. But the people, those are the ones who felt the strain the most. The causes themselves, they will constantly change. They will always exist, but the people will not. And I come to places like this to pay my respects to those who believed in the vision, who came here, who did what they were told to do. They served so proudly. But on both sides of the coin, there was great loss. There was great loss of those who had done what they thought was the right thing for the cause, whichever side that they fought for. So today we honor them by taking a few moments of silence as we close out this video. <laughs> 